All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to episode four of the world's most exciting classroom. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I will be your host for today. If you are following along, you know that a lot has happened in a week. The ship was just in Tenerife, where the first Darwin leaders were on board and undertaking their conservation projects and making some incredible videos. In fact, later in today's episode, we're going to meet uh, one of those teams, one of those Darwin leaders and camera uh, operators, and we're going to get to see what they produced about pilot whales. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, the ship has now left Tenerife, the Oosterskelde, and it is making its way towards Cape Verde. I'm going to share my screen right now. We're going to take a little look at our interactive map. So you can see here, this map is on the Darwin website, darwin200.com. You can see where the the ship left Plymouth, made its way across the Bay of Biscay, stopped in Spain, and then continued on until it reached Tenerife uh, in the Canary Islands. So as you use this map, you can see that there's photos and videos being uploaded in real time. So you can follow along in your classroom and at home and check out some of that. Here's a little video clip of the ship leaving Tenerife a few days ago. And then it's continued on, making its way towards Cape Verde. We're going to share a few clips uh, from things they've seen along the way, like this flying fish that ended up uh, jumping on deck. And I know that they've seen many more jumping in the waves. And then you can see where the Oosterskelde is right now in relation to Cape Verde as we zoom out a little bit. And there we go. That is the next destination. A new group of Darwin leaders will come on board. And of course, we'll do a live event next week from Cape Verde, and I'll talk a little bit more about that once we get towards the end of the event. Now, there's something special on board the ship, and we haven't shared this yet. And what this is, is something called the Explorers Club flag. And I think the best way to share this is to do it through a video, uh, which will introduce the flag and what it means. So let's get that video queued up here. And here we go. Welcome everyone to the Darwin 200. Tomorrow morning, we set sail for two years following Charles Darwin's voyage of the Beagle. And along the way, we're gonna to get to carry this really special flag from the Explorers Club. So for those who don't know, the Explorers Club was founded in 1904, and it's very well known for its famous first. Members of the Explorers Club were the first to the moon, first to both poles, first to the top of Everest, and first to the deepest point of the ocean. So these flags are passed out on expeditions, and then they have a history where they spend years going around the world on different science expeditions. So this is flag 101. And this flag has been circulating since the 1940s. It's been to all seven continents. It's been to the top of Everest. In fact, it just returned from the International Space Station before being sent here for us on the Darwin 200. We're gonna fly it here in Plymouth uh, in the UK where Charles Darwin originally left on the Beagle. We'll probably fly it again in the Galapagos, which of course we know uh, is one of the sites that helped talk, uh, Darwin form his theory of natural selection. And then in two years from now, when we return to the UK uh, in Falmouth, we'll fly the flag again. So here it is, the Explorers Club flag. So a pretty amazing piece of history that we're carrying on the ship. Uh, it is so delicate. It's been circulating on expeditions all over the world since the 1940s. Uh, so we can only fly it at certain times because we don't want to damage that amazing flag. So you've got a great view there of the Oosterskelde leaving Plymouth. So why don't we go there right now? Let's go on board the ship. Uh, we've got Roger and Tom standing by and let's take a look and see what they're up to. Hey, Roger. Hey, Tom. How's it going? Hello. Hey, Joe. It's going really well. Oh, that's great. It's so great to see both of you. It looks like another beautiful day on the ocean. Yeah, every, every day has been pretty sunny so far. It's been staying dry and glorious. All right. Well, let's get the, the official pan around. Let's take a little look at where you are. 
Well, we're here. We're here on the Vauxhall at the minute. You can see the you can see the jib, and if we spin around, you can see the other sails as well. I haven't learned their names yet. They might that, that will come a bit later, I think. But you can see some of the crew down there, and at the back, you might be able to make out the wheelhouse. Ooh, there we go. And here's the bow spread. This is the best view on the ship. Yeah, very cool. I'm going to share a little clip here because not too long ago, um, you guys saw some, you guys had some pictures here. Looks like those dolphins love playing the bow wave. That's so cool. I know uh, you were a bit closer to land when you saw those uh, Atlantic spotted dolphins. And I guess things have quieted down a little bit now that you're more into the open ocean. Yeah, at the minute, it's mainly just um, mainly just great sheer waters and lots and lots and lots of flying fish. Yeah. Right <laughs> yeah. yeah, literally one just in the background as we were speaking. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. So you were on Tenerife. And you guys were pretty busy running around, filming. Uh, I wonder if you want to share just for a minute. Tell us a little bit about what that experience was like. Try and sum it up uh, in a minute or two. Wow. There's, uh, there's so much there um, just in three days. Um, my, my project was on um, endemic birds of Tenerife and some of the problems they were facing. We, had, um, we were very privileged to be shown around by the wonderful wildlife guide, Miguel, and he he showed us the blue chaffinch, the the great spotted woodpecker, and the, the canary bird. Um, loads of like really cool endemic species. We found out that they're actually under a lot of pressure from the recent fire. Um, you know, the lack of the lack of water and um, and pressure from tourist activities. It's uh, it was a real privilege to you know to be to be shown around and just get an understanding of what those, uh, of the wonderful work those guys are doing to, to conserve the, the island's wildlife. Tom, what oh doing? yeah, um, so my project was, I was with Elliot and Heimer looking at the uh, coastal uh, habitats and ecosystems and the uh, geological heritage of the island and basically what's been impacting on these um, coastal habitats. And one of the main issues was the uh, was tourism and how that's increased over the last uh, last few years and the human impact on these areas. A lot of the issue is down to people not actually knowing what's, what these different areas are and the, um, the importance of them. So one of the biggest uh, things, some of the work that needs to be done that Elliot came up with was um, looking at how uh, people need to become more educated and learn about these different areas so they can understand what's going on and then respect them more all right that's great and just this morning you sent me a few little video clips here so we can kind of show the yeah. classrooms and those tuning in a little bit of what tenerife looked like so i'm going to load this up here and if you want to say anything about what we're seeing go ahead yeah no problem so this is uh Tede mountain in the um national reserve and you can just see how barren and uh desolate the actual landscape is but it's actually pretty amazing what sort of stuff can survive in these those environments um this here is one of the lava tubes so basically during the, the eruption you'd have the lava flowing down underneath the crust and when the the um these caves and caverns empty out you get left with this amazing huge cave and i think that one's the highest point was about 10 meters high which is pretty crazy and then again here's the amazing green trees just like jutting out the volcanic uh, moon-like landscape those, those, amazing those are actually the endemic species of canary and pine um that's unique to um unique to the canaries and that that provides the habitat for a lot of the um a lot of the endemic birds and and lizards and stuff so that 
and unfortunately a lot of those trees were lost to the fire but um yeah, well, I love that word, uh, Rodri, endemic. And that's something that classrooms are going to hear come up a lot, especially yeah. when we're visiting islands. So things, it's... plant species, animal species found nowhere else in the world. So what an opportunity to get to see some of those. Totally, totally. It's been such a privilege, such a privilege. All right. Well, in a second, we're going to take a few questions from some of the classrooms tuning in. So if you're tuning in via YouTube, um, please send in some questions via the chat and we'll work some of those in. We have three classrooms hiding out backstage, and I'm going to let them ask a quick question uh, before we let you guys go. But you've been at sea now for a few days. Um, there's a new group of, of passengers on board. What's what's going on? How are things going? Um, well, everyone on board is it's been lovely so far. Yeah, we've got um, everyone's very interested in, in what we do. Um, I've just spent the morning. Um, taking lots of photographs of people setting sails and uh, uh, repairing, you know, repairing bits of rope and stuff. So, and, uh, you know, getting footage of people climbing aloft. So, uh, yeah, it's been, everyone's been great so far and can't wait to see what happens next. All right, perfect. Let's meet uh, some of our classrooms and let's take a few questions here. So I'm going to bring in our first classroom here. Uh, we've got Mrs. Skaggs group hanging out with us in Texas. Uh, how are we doing today, boys and girls? Hi. All right, Hi, let's get a, a question or two from Audrey and Tom. Have you seen any animals that shouldn't be alive? Do you mean like you mean like invasive species, like maybe you shouldn't be there? Maybe you shouldn't be there. Yeah. The um, not even invasive species, but the the uh, seawaters aren't normally found in these areas, are they? You were saying earlier. Well, it's not. There, ha there hasn't been many sightings of them in the area 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 we are at the moment. So it's been pretty interesting being some of the uh, first people to, not first people, but um, being able to observe something that hasn't been observed there very often. Sorry, Tom, you cut out. Which species was that? What did you see? Uh, it's the great shearwater. Ah, okay. So the great shearwater species of bird. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Let's see if they have one more quick question for us there in Texas before we go to another classroom. Before we go to another classroom. How... Uh, what's, what's the, uh -uh. Uh, how many species have you saw? Like different types of species. Uh, how many species of birds? Just We've in general, I think they're wondering how many, how many animals have you seen? If you can put a rough number on wow. it. Wow. Um, a rough number, okay. Uh, we know the yeah. birds. We know, we birds. know, we know the birds. The birds were we're at about sixty-one species of bird at the minute, wow. and for everything else, we've seen we've seen lizards, whales, dolphins, beetles. So I'd I'd probably guess maybe another twenty or thirty of those. So near enough a hundred species so far. Very, and very we're cool. only on leg two, so there's many, many, many more to come, hopefully. Thousands to go, I bet. Very cool. I bet. Can't wait. <laughs> All right. Let's go to Miss Collins, fourth and fifth graders. They're joining us here in Canada. How are we doing today? We are good, thanks. Okay. How, question? Do, you, how do you have internet? Uh, can you hear her? We got it. Yeah. How do you guys have connection? We have internet. Oh, maybe Rodri and Tom can't hear me at the moment. Okay. So they're exiting and they're going to pop back in. I'm going to answer that question for them because that's one of the reasons I was in Plymouth was not only to bring the Explorers Club flag, but also to make sure the internet was ready. So we're using Starlink. We have a special dish for the ship. It's called a maritime unit. And that lets us broadcast from the ocean pretty much anywhere in the world, which is why we're able to see Tom and Rodri now. 
Then we also have a roam unit, and that's a unit we can take on land and we can broadcast from pretty much anywhere on land. But here we've got Tom uh, and Rodri back. Hello. So still, we're back. Sorry, guys. You're back. <laughs> you're still in the middle of the ocean, so the connectivity isn't always perfect. Sometimes we're going to get those little um, those dropouts, <laughs> but it's amazing we can see you so clearly. It's great. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's. <laughs> There's a very unlikely chance for that to happen. There's, the connection so far has been super stable and reliable. Yeah, we were getting speeds, I think, better than some of the students have in their classroom or even at home. Wow. So it's, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> very, very impressive. All right, Ms. Collins, All right, you want to get another question? Another question. Yes. So far, what's been your favorite part? Favorite part? Favorite part. It's a difficult one. It's a very <laughs> tricky question. I have I have to say when we saw the when we saw the fin whales down in the Bay of Biscay, that was yeah, that was an that's a lot of top. Yeah. <laughs> that was incredible. The second right. largest animal is impressive seeing their immense size and how gentle and majestic they were just floating by the ship. Very, very cool. And that video is if you go to social media, if you look up uh, Darwin 200 and then an underscore on most uh, platforms you can find that video or if you go back to episode one you can find that video as well uh, of the world's most exciting classroom. Mr. Hancock's crew is hanging out with us today. How are you doing Mr. Hancock? Very well thanks for having us in Joe. Hey guys yeah, uh, we were kind of curious where did uh, the passion for this research and this line of work come from? Wow <laughs> Um, well, it's been it's been a long time coming. I've I've always been obsessed with animals and the natural world since since I was a kid. Studied marine science at university, and then I picked up a camera, and a few years later, here we are. Just uh, <laughs> followed that passion and that obsession for, for wildlife, and I've I've been very very fortunate to get where I am. Wonderful. Uh, I'm just curious, other students, if they wanted to learn more about animals, how would they get more involved? Uh, learn more about animals. Yeah. Wow. Study them, help them, protect them. I, I've learned most of what I know through through books, um, wildlife documentaries, and really, probably the best way you can get involved is to like find out about your local like wildlife conservation charities groups, and just just get involved, like do some volunteering. Go on, you know, go bird watching, go and do um, species counts, do do all of that stuff. Like, perfect. Thanks, yeah. Tom. Let's get uh, your answer in there, Tom. How did you get pulled into this world? Uh, well, I refer well this specific world on ships with Stu. Basically, uh, that came about with a very short notice notification to to come on board as a cameraman for the UK voyage. So. Most of my passion and uh, interest in the wildlife was born out of that uh, out of that project, and since then I've just, just fell in love with the natural world. And yeah, it's just now we're on this ship going around the world, and it just gets better and better. Absolutely. All right. Well, classrooms, we're going to come back your way shortly, but for now, Tom and Rodri, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to see you again in Cape Verde. Uh, I know lunchtime is coming up on the ship and timing is strict, so we don't want you guys to miss your lunch. <laughs> yeah, that would be just get hungry. <laughs> yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, guys. We'll see you soon. No Thank you so much. We'll see you later. See you soon. All right. See you guys. Bye. Okay. So now we're going to visit with some of our Darwin leaders. So as I mentioned, in each port darwin leaders from around the world are coming to join the ship to pair up with camera operators and local conservation organizations to look at issues in the incredible places we're visiting around conservation and then to look at what's happening to look at what's being done to protect these plants or these animals or ecosystems and then what can we continue doing uh, in the future so joining us we have iro who is joining us from greece uh, and she is one of the Darwin leaders. And then we have Lorimer joining us as well. And he is one of the camera operators. So let's bring them up front and center. Hey guys, how are we doing today? Hi everybody. Thanks for having Hello, us. Hello, great. Thank you. Thanks for having us on. All right. Well, it's great to have you both. Uh, not too long ago, you were on 
Lewis or Scalde, you were in the Canary Islands, uh, in uh, on Tenerife. I would love, and I know our classrooms would love to hear a little bit about that experience. What was that week like? Uh, it was amazing. Uh, we're in Tenerife for a week. Our project was about the pilot whales, which is one of the many species of whales. They're in the dolphin family, so they're not one of the big ones, but they're super, super cool. And they're one of the very few species of whales that live in Tenerife all year round because the location there is very special. So we just spent a lot of time learning about the whales and Lauren Murray did a lot of filming and it was awesome. It was great. All right. So Lauren Mayer, you were doing the filming. You had the big heavy gear. I think you've got your camera handy for us. So you can That's show right. us your tools. Yeah, I'd love to show you the camera I shot on. We use three different camera systems during the week. But I'm going to show you the first one first. This is the camera that I use for most of the week. So this is the body here, and then this is the lens. And it's a really good lens for this kind of documentary work because it can do everything. We don't want to be changing lenses when we're out on a speedboat and it's like splashing on water. So I use one camera for the whole week. I think I change lens once. And it's got this really big fluffy thing here. It's called a dead cat and it covers a microphone. And we use this for recording the whales or when Eero is speaking to camera, when they're up close, we can hear everything that they're, all the noise that they're making. And then the second way they recorded the whales was actually using a very high tech piece of equipment to get underneath the water. It was a GoPro and it was strapped to a really, really high tech rod called a wooden stick. And we used it to see the whales when they were swimming through the sea. It looks absolutely incredible. And the last thing we used was a drone to get those establishing shots and to show uh, the, the wider landscape of where they are. So that was the three ways that we filmed them this week. All right, very cool. So, you know, you, uh, you know, you had to do, you had to learn about uh, the pilot whales and the challenges they were facing. You had to learn about the conservation work that was happening. And then you had to think about what more could be done. How can we continue this work? So can you tell us a little bit about uh, some of the challenges, the, you know, the threats to pilot whales uh, around the Canary Islands? Well, in the Canary Islands, the whales face uh... A lot of issues as they do all around the world most of which are a direct result of human activities so the canary islands are a very touristic area and so lots of whales face the issue of marine traffic there are lots of boats going by the areas where they live you have touristic boats you have the ferries connecting the islands you have whale watching boats kayaks jet skis and this to the whales is very bad and invasive it's like uh, having you know a very busy street in your living room it's very loud, it's very busy for them, and that can cause them a lot of stress, can cause them to not rest properly, to not find food, to uh, go missing and not find the rest of their family. So this would be the main issue for the whales, the marine traffic. Okay, all right. So Laura Mayer, as the camera operator, uh, you know, what were some of the main challenges you faced uh it looks like you were in a few different environments so what were some of those challenges we were in a few different environments a few different boats and one of the main uh issues when you're filming from a boat is obviously it's really unsteady and the deck is going up and down at the same time the waves are going up and down um and so we have to sort of counter that you have to sort of push yourself against the boat to try and get the shots to be as smooth as possible there is another thing you can do which is film in slow motion you see those beautiful shots of the whales jumping out in slow motion it really helps um, to stabilize things. But my biggest worry was actually we wouldn't see the whales at all because how do you tell a story about pilot whales if you don't see any pilot whales? But fortunately, there's actually 400 that live on that small stretch of coast. So when we got there and we saw them on the first day, it was a big relief because we'd seen them and we got at least some footage. And after that, it was just adding to that library. Um, but definitely the, the movement of the boat was the biggest challenge for sure. All right, absolutely amazing. Uh, I think we should take a moment now and and see the first video you created, Eero. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, I think the students would love a chance to see it, see these amazing pilot whales, uh, and then we'll take a few questions from them. I think there'll probably be a few. So let me queue up that video uh, and let's take a look here. Tenerife, Canary Islands. A land of fire, forests, rocks. But a few miles offshore, under the Tata mountain, a family of pilot whales can be found. They have been swimming together in this area for decades. 
This pod will stay together for their whole life. They will travel the ocean, hunt, breathe and raise their young together. A life in synchrony. My name is Ro and I'm a Darwin 200 leader. I am here in Tenerife studying the conservation of pilot whales. short fin pilot whales, or Calderón tropical in Spanish, of the dolphin family, are extremely cool animals, mainly for their insane ability to dive up to a thousand meters deep, eat on giant squid, and then find their way back to their families using clicks and echolocation sounds. They're extremely intelligent animals, and they care deeply for their families, raising their youngs and spending time with them for up to 15 years and mourning their deaths. I spoke to some specialists to help me understand what other factors make pilot whales so interesting and so worthy of our protection. El hecho de que pueda sumergirse hasta unos mil metros de profundidad para encontrar su comida eh, durante los avistamientos que lo vemos en superficie. Normalmente los animales están descansando. Pilot whales are the most curious, sociable, friendly animals. It's their willingness to come to the boat. When you've got intelligence, you've got curiosity. And obviously every day they display their curiosity. Es un, una especie muy gregaria, viven siempre en grupos familiares. Eh, los grupos pueden estar compuestos por hasta 30 animales, ¿no? Y, y bueno, y se trata de que son, viven en una especie de línea matrilineal. La, el, la, las hembras son las líderes, son las matriarcas. Y bueno, y son las que suelen llevar pues, el liderazgo del grupo, ¿no? Aunque ya son hembras que no son fértiles, pueden, todavía tienen mucho que enseñar al resto de la manada y, y todo ese conocimiento lo tienen que transmitir pues, de madres a hijas para que la población pues, siga existiendo. Cuando el whale habla, no, no. ¿Sabes? Antes de que se termine eso, el whale ha viajado 30 miles en el océano. Estamos conectados con estos animales de tantas maneras. Every time they choose to interact with us, they show us countless examples of their amazing intelligence and emotional depth. Sabes que hay muchas muertes de las crías, de los bebés, y que ellos por su comportamiento social y gregario llevan a cabo algo que se llama un requiem post mortem, que es que cuando se muere una cría, todo el grupo familiar la sigue en una especie de funeral durante días portando la cría en la boca. Babies have actually been born right next to this boat. They've actually come to the boat and you just, you only know it's just happened because you see all the blood and then you see the baby. We saw a big floating net in the ocean and whenever we have uh, big objects of trash, plastic, we take it up. And this is also a reason to why I'm on this boat. Uh, but yeah, we took out a big piece of net from the ocean and just a minute after, we had so many young pilot whales coming in the front and playing, and they wouldn't leave us. They just stayed, they were turning around, looking at us, talking, and I was so sure in this moment that they saw us take up the net and they wanted to thank us. Los calderones son un símbolo para la isla de Tenerife porque ya en la época que habitaban aquí los guanches ya ellos también habitaban el mar de Tenerife y es un símbolo porque bueno, es típico ver el teide con los calderones en el mar y eso representa pues algo muy importante para nuestros habitantes del azul. Whales have been in these waters for hundreds of years, but during that time the world around them has changed drastically. The massification of tourism and human expansion have caused a number of issues for these animals. This is their world. It's not ours, it's their world. In the next episode, we will discuss these matters with a number of experts that will explain to us the issues the whales are facing today. Hola, me llamo Aldo Mínguez Sánchez. ¿Te gustan los ballenas? Sí. ¿Por qué? Porque son muy grandes, tienen una cosa que dispara agua, uh -huh. son muy guay.
All right. Absolutely incre incredible work, guys. The footage of the whales underwater is absolutely beautiful. Um, and, and being able to put something like that together uh, in, you know, a tight time frame must have been challenging as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, we were, um, the ship has breakfast at 7.30 every morning, so we're getting up at 7 o'clock in the morning, which isn't too bad, that's like a normal day of work, right? And then we would leave at about, we'd have a team meeting about 8.30 in the morning, and every group, there were five groups, so two people in a group, so 10 people, we'd all meet and we'd talk about what we were going to do that day. Then we'd leave at about 9 o'clock, and we wouldn't get back until just before dinner, about 7.30 in the evening. And that was just the filming, and then the editing would happen in the evenings after we got back until quite late at night and then we'd keep going the next day and we'd get back into it. So it was very, very intense. Um, but our goal was to finish this first film before the end of the week. Um, yeah, it was really important to us. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Great work. Uh, in a minute, we're going to talk to uh, some students. We'll give them a chance to ask you some questions. I do want to share one more thing before uh, we move on. It's just a few pictures that I have here. Uh, so these were the leaders from the first week. Uh, there were five there in Tenerife. And then just a few pictures of the two of you out in the field. So it looks like you had a lot of fun. Um, yes. I'm sure it was just an incredible experience. Uh, and you can see some of those conditions that you were trying to film in, which, which would have been challenging, uh, of course. So there's a few of those shots, a few different boats uh, to kind of give students a perspective of what, what that might have looked like. That last one was a speedboat, which was uh, very bumpy because, of course, like you know, the speed it goes, especially when you're going fast. But when when you stop and you turn the engine off, it goes completely silent, and you can just hear the water. And then we saw the whales, and when they get closer, you can actually hear them clicking and talking to each other. And also because the boat is so low to the water, you can get your camera nice and low as well, look across at them and then looking down on them, which looks really nice. All right, very cool. So we're going to go to questions, but before we do that, we're going to play something called Kahoot. So this might be new to some of the classrooms who are joining us. Basically, it's an interactive online quiz, uh, and we're going to test our students' knowledge, see what they learned hanging out with us today, and then we'll take some questions. So that means I have to share my screen one more time here. Let's get that going. There we go. And we should see the Kahoot. And we are going to play it. So there are going to be four questions, some true and false. Uh, some of them are going to be multiple choice. You need to visit kahoot.it. So you can see it up here, kahoot.it. It's going to ask you for a PIN number. Today's PIN is 297807. If you have one-to-one -one technology, you can join right at your desk. If not, no big deal. Your teacher could put it up at the front of the room and you could shout out your answers to him or her. If you have a mobile device, maybe a tablet, maybe a phone, you can scan that QR code and it will bring you right in. There are 20 seconds for each question. If you get the right answer, you get points. If you get the right answer quickly, you get even more points. Uh, if you get the answer wrong, even if you put it in as fast as you can, we got nothing for you. You have to get those answers correct. And then for our winner today, if you send me an email, we will send your class a $50 Amazon gift card. So uh, if you are that winner, I will share the email address uh, shortly. You want to send it us a message and we will get you your gift card. We've got the legend leopard, the bright zebra, the knowing possum, the fast unicorn. Let's give maybe another 10 seconds for students to join uh, or classrooms. Uh, and then we will get our Kahoot quiz going. Okay, here we go. Count us in, in three, two, one. And here's our first question. It is a true or false. Pilot whales are part of the dolphin family. Is that true? Or is that false? Pilot whales are part of the dolphin family. True or false? Uh, I don't think they can see the slide with the questions. Oh, did it not load? Let me switch. Mm -hmm. uh, let me switch the screen to here really quickly. We are um, on slide two here. I mean, as I okay. see, I need to put the, the chat. 
Yeah, I think it shared the wrong screen. Let me try that one more time. Let's get the right one going. <laughs> okay, let's try this one. Okay, there we go. This one should look better for everybody joining us there. Uh, okay, so absolutely, that was true. What's that going to do to our leaderboard? The lucky dolphin. Well, that's very convenient. Uh, is in first place right now. <laughs> Let's jump to our next question. This is a multiple choice. What is the main issue impacting pilot whales? Is it marine traffic, fishing, pollution, or water temperature? So what did Igor talk about is one of the main issues uh, that's impacting pilot whales. We've got five more seconds to get that answer locked in. All right, good job, crew. It is marine traffic. There was a hint there in that photo. The lucky dolphin is holding on strong. Let's go to our next question about how many pilot whales are found around Tenerife. So this was in the video. Uh, was it 50, 400, 1,000, or 2,000? So about how many pilot whales uh, are found around Tenerife? All right, good job, crew. It is 400. Ooh, Lucky Dolphin might go tape to tape. Here we go. One last question to wrap things up. True and false? Uh, pilot whales are solitary, so they don't usually travel in groups. Is that true or is that false? Pilot whales are solitary. So you're going to find them on their own, not uh, in groups. A few more seconds to lock in that answer, and we will see what our podium looks like. Okay, that is false. We know they travel in groups. They're very, very social uh, animals. Let's look at our podium. In third place, we've got the Mountain Sphinx. In second place, the Bright Zebra. And holding down that top spot, who's it going to be? All right, Lucky Dolphin held on strong. Very cool. Thanks for playing along with us. I'm going to come back from that screen share. I'm going to put a banner up there. If you are in the classroom of uh, the Lucky Dolphin, please send an email here, ebtsoyp uh, at gmail.com, and we will make sure we get that gift card uh, to your classroom. So let's go with a little Q&A action. First, I want to say we've got uh, Mr. Ryan's crew joining us in Ireland, and they had asked a question uh, for Tom and Rodri that I missed in the chat. They were wondering how long to Cape Verde. So it's going to be about nine days uh, to get to Cape Verde. So let's get going here. Mrs. Skaggs crew, do you have a question uh, for Lormer or Iro? Okay, yes, that's it. I got a question. How many, um, how many species of whales is there? In total. Hey, Tyson. In total or in Tenerife? In Tenerife. Uh, most of them. In Tenerife, actually, you can find one third of the world's cetaceans. Cetaceans is whales and dolphins alike. So in Tenerife, actually, you can see most of them. But uh, we talked about the pilot whales because they live there throughout the year, where the other whales, like the sperm whales or the humpback whales, travel through Tenerife but don't actually live there all year round. All right. Great question. Let's grab one more before we go to another class. Before we go to another class. So when you film the whales, like when you film the whales, do you did you use the underwater camera? Yeah. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we so um we had three ways of filming the whales. We had a drone from over the top, but we didn't normally use that for whales, we just use that for landscapes. We had the camera that I showed you, like this one here. And then yeah, for those underwater shots, maybe Ira can describe how she got the underwater shots when I was filming with this one. So in the one in one of the pictures you saw that we are on a very small boat. And so to film the whales from there, we had a GoPro. And then that was attached to a stick, like you have on a broom, a, like a wooden stick. And then the GoPro is attached to that. And then you just go on the side of the boat and put it in the water. 
discreetly to not bother the animals, of course. You let them come to you. You don't go and put the camera where they're swimming. And this is how you get the underwater footage. And you don't see much from the surface, but they're there because if they want to, they come close to the boat and then you don't see much, but then you look at the footage and they're swimming all around. Very, very cool. All right, Mr. Hancock's crew, let's bring you guys in. Hey, everybody. Uh, we were the Lucky Dolphins, so we're feeling pretty lucky this morning. Whoa, very cool. Uh, we're, we were curious about, have you noticed with the pilot whales, have they changed any of their behavior? I remember reading this summer about orca whales and how they would start to uh, sabotage boats and take the propellers apart, uh, trying to figure out a better way to survive. Have the pilot whales changed any of their behaviors? Well, they're more stressed for one. Uh, so what, what they mostly try to do is some of the times they try to avoid some of the boats. They're very social animals as well. So if a boat is discreet enough, they, they're usually curious enough to go out and see, but now the traffic is out of the charts. It's very, very busy in the sea. So what they do is try and avoid. Some dolphin pods have left the area. The pilot whales have not left yet, but maybe someday they will. And one of the experts told us that they are they have signs of increased stress. So they're very stressed compared to other pods nearby. But no, they're not uh they wouldn't be attacking anyone. That's no. No, I was just curious if they started taking apart the boats or started to sabotage a few of the propellers. No. Not yet, no. All right, thanks. No. Thank right. you. Thanks for Hancock's crew. Uh, and congratulations, you lucky dolphins. Uh, okay, Mrs. Collins, four fives. Do you have a question or two for us? Um, how many, I mean, have you guys seen any jellyfish? Not in the Sorry? I, I don't think we saw a jellyfish when we were in Brief. Yeah. I've seen them where I live in Scotland before. Um, but we didn't see one in Tenerife. The one really interesting animal that we saw that wasn't to do with our study at all was a sea turtle. And it was a fully grown sea turtle just floating, chilling out on, on top of the water, which we were actually quite concerned about because sometimes if they consume, if they eat plastic that's washed up in the sea, um, it can make their buoyancy, they, they it can make them too buoyant so they can't submerge. And at first we were really concerned that that had happened. But um, when our boat got a little bit closer, it dived down into the water and it was fine. But it was, it was my first time seeing a sea turtle in the wild, which was really interesting. Oh, that's awesome. Very cool. Let's that's grab one more question. Grab one more question. Let's there. Okay. What is a group of whales called? Sorry, I didn't get that. Oh, he was wondering what a group of whales is called. It's called a pod, a group of whales or dolphins. But you can also call it a family because there are species that spend their whole life with their family. So when you see many whales uh, swimming together, it's usually their mom, their aunt, their sister, their grandma. And it's usually families. They're very, very close together. So they have very, very special bonds with each other. So it's a family or a pod. All right. And one quick question here from YouTube from our group joining us in Ireland. They want to know... Uh, how inquisitive were the pilot whales? Were they getting so close to the boat you could have reached out? You could, but you shouldn't. Uh, usually they're very curious animals. So when we were on the small boat, what you have to do, you have to follow a code of conduct. So if you're very close to the animals, you have to turn off the engine and just stay still because they know you're there. Whales have extremely good hearing, so they know the boat is there. If they want to come to you to check you out, they will, and they usually do. And um, yeah, they come very close to the boat. You could reach out, but you shouldn't. You really have to respect that, you know, we are at the sea and the sea is their home. You cannot bother them in any way. You cannot just drive your boat directly at them. You can just hope that they really, really want to see you too. And they come to you. All right. Very cool. And that should apply everywhere, right? Anytime with a wild animal, keep your distance. And if they choose to, you know, come a little closer, and interact in any way, well, then that's a lucky experience. You can get some good pictures, but yeah, hands to yourself. Very cool. Well, can Lauren, I show you a fact before we close as well? Yeah, yeah, go it. yeah. Because, I mean, and maybe everyone that uh, has been following really understands that we really like them, but they're actually very, very cool and smart. So for instance, you saw the whales at the surface when we saw them, but you know, these whales, pilot whales can actually dive up to thousand meters depth because they go very, very deep. 
they dive very, very deep, they hold their breath, they dive deep, and then they go after giant squid. So it's also very cool to think that when you see them at the surface, they maybe have just gotten up from a thousand meter deep dive. Amazing. I lied. I'm going to sneak in one more question. Mr. Mayo's class, grade twos are joining us. They're on uh, YouTube and they want to know about how big are those pilot whales going to grow? Not too big. Those are like five meters. Not too big. Five meters. All or right. Whale. For whales. They're not that big. They're of the smallest family, like dolphins. Okay. Very cool. Well, Iro and Lorimer, thank you so much for being with us today. You guys had an incredible experience. And I can't wait to see the rest of the videos uh, in your series. We'll get those up on YouTube so the classrooms can check them out. Thank you so much for having us. It's been so much fun speaking to you and speaking to everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. We're going to tuck you backstage. There we go. And now, in a moment, we're going to bring in Stu McPherson, expedition leader in the Darwin studio. Uh, but we've been doing our experiments. And so each week we do an experiment. Classrooms then have two weeks to send in the results, post pictures to social media. Uh, we have prizes for the top three classrooms. Um, and then we share the results. So let's share the results video from uh, our ocean acidification experiment. And then we'll bring Stu in with us to talk uh, about our lucky winners this week. So here we go. So what did your shells do? Did you also find that the shell that you put in vinegar decreased in weight, whereas the one that you put in water stayed exactly the same? Did you manage to answer the three research questions? The first question asked what happened in the experiment. As the shells are made of calcium carbonate, which reacts with acid, by putting it in the vinegar, some of the calcium carbonate reacted and dissolved away. And that explains why the shell that we've taken out of the vinegar weighs less than when we put it in. Some of the shell has reacted with the acid. The second question was, what was the gas we saw bubbling from the shells? Well, the answer to that was carbon dioxide. The reaction between the acid and the calcium carbonate releases carbon dioxide that bubbles back up to the surface. The last question asked what was the impact on the marine life in the world's oceans? Well, unfortunately, as the world's ocean's acidity increases, it can actually kill some marine organisms and damage others. This is because, as we've seen with the shells, the increasing acidity of the world's oceans dissolves the calcium carbonate, making the exoskeletons and bones of marine life more and more fragile. When we tested the pH of the vinegar, we saw that it was very, very acidic. Of course, the oceans are nowhere near as acidic in real life. But nevertheless, as they increase in acidity, this process that we've seen in this experiment acts on all of the different marine animals, including the mollusks and seashells out in the world's oceans. So as the acidity increases, the more calcium carbonate will dissolve and bubble away, making the marine life more and more vulnerable. A big thank you to everyone who took part and uploaded results. Let's see the winning entries to this experiment. Let's bring Stuart in with us right now from the studio. Hey, Stuart, how are you? Hello, everyone. Lovely to see you. What those pilot worlds interesting? Absolutely amazing. Lots of good questions, too. Very much so, definitely. Well, we had lots of entries this, this over the last two weeks to our ocean acidification question. It was very, very hard to choose the winner, but the winning entry was by Phoebe, Ingrid, Titus, and, and Corinne from the USA. Um, I think Joe's got their sheet up here. They had some very interesting results. They put the shell in um, vinegar, in acetic acid and, and water, but if you look at their top box, their shell entirely disappeared in the vinegar, um, which was better than mine one. Mine, mine only lost a few grams of, of, of mass. So their shell entirely dissolved, which is quite incredible. But you'll notice they also um, had no change in the one in water, which was the same as my experiment. Well, let's look, go to the three questions. So as you recall, um, the first question was, what effect did the acetic acid have? Well, um, our wonderful winners, 
absolutely said the right answer. The acetic acid dissolved the, the, car, the calcium carbonate in the seashell. Um, and the reason why the acetic acid, the vinegar, was more effective of this is because it's acidic. So they got that absolutely right. The next question was a little bit tricky. Um, you remember we spoke about calcium carbonate. So the, the clue about what the bubbles were was in the word calcium carbonate. Um, our wonderful four winners also guessed that correctly, that it was it was from carbon dioxide. It's from carbon gas, like, like carbonated beverages. So the answer there was was carbon dioxide, which they, they got right, just like in, in carbonated drinks. And then lastly, the third question was, um, what impact does that have on the marine life around the world? And again, as our four winners here very kindly wrote, it, it can absolutely severely impact wildlife. In extreme cases, it can kill marine life as well. And the way we can solve that problem is reducing our pollution and reducing our impact in the world's oceans so that we don't make the world's oceans as acidic uh, in the future. So Phoebe, Ingrid, Titus and Corinne, you've all, you've won together, you've won a 50 pound or 50 US dollar or 50 Canadian. So we've got three vouchers every week. We had two other wonderful entries from Mike from Somerset in England that also won and Francois from France. Um, so all of those top winners won. We had, I think, about 50 entries uh, this week. So well done, everyone, for, for taking part and putting in the effort to make those wonderful experiments. And I believe we've got this week's experiment now coming up. All right, let's get into it. In last week's activity, we looked at the processes that drive natural selection, the factors that explain why the Darwin finches have beaks that differ in their shape and their size. Well, this week, your task is to take that thinking one step further and think how and why animals change on islands. Islands are really, really interesting because they're isolated from larger ecosystems. So animals and plants often evolve in unusual and really interesting ways, often quite quickly. So they're a perfect way to look at the processes that Charles Darwin studied. You often see on islands examples of island gigantism. That's where animals and sometimes plants grow much, much, much bigger than their counterparts and relatives in other parts of the world. A really good example of this is the Komodo dragon. Komodo dragons live on the islands of Komodo in Indonesia, and they're the largest living terrestrial lizard alive today. They're armoured to the teeth. Their mouths are lined with sharp fangs, and they also secrete a venomous saliva. Their skin is armoured and like chainmail. They also have 20 sharp claws and a whip tail that they can use for their defence. These animals grow over three metres long, and can weigh up to 70 kilos. Why do you think the Komodo dragons have evolved all of those adaptations and have grown so big on the Komodo islands? What advantages would that give them? Another process that you see on islands is the exact opposite of island gigantism. It's called island dwarfism, where animals and sometimes plants grow really, really small in size relative to their counterparts in the rest of the world. An example of this is Brachysia chameleons on the island of Madagascar. This group of chameleons are known for being tiny. The smallest can be just three centimetres in length. It's incredible looking at these little guys to think that they have a beating heart, blood vessels and bones in their tiny, tiny bodies. They often live at the base of trees why do you think the Komodo dragons have grown so big on Komodo? And why do you think the Brachysia chameleons have grown so small on the island of Madagascar? Fill in the PDF on the Darwin 200 website and send in your answers within two weeks to info at darwin200.com. Tune in in two weeks' time to find out the winning answers and see if you've won. Good luck and see you next time. All right. So you have two weeks to get those answers in. 
Uh, you can email those answers to classroom at darwin200.com. There is one week left for last week's demonstration focused on natural selection. So you can still get those answers in. And then if you want to see any of the videos, find the PDFs, you can visit darwin200.com. We would love to see pictures uh, of your classroom working on the experiments or working through the answers and post it on social media. Uh, you can use the hashtag Darwin200. Um, and yes, yeah, Stu, we're excited. The, the experiments are rolling along. Absolutely. I can't wait to show you the answer to the, this week's uh, activity. It's really interesting. Just remember that tiny little chameleon versus the gigantic Komodo dragon. Remember, they're both reptiles. They're distantly related to one another. Why is one so tiny and the other so big and fierce? All right. Well, to wrap up today, we have our curiosity of the week. So I'm going to play our correct uh, answer. And then, Stu, you can you can share some of those who sent in their answers with us. Absolutely. Last week's curiosity was this object here. Your task was to write in and guess what you think this creature might be. Well, some of you thought it might be a type of fish or a ray. Actually, it's a horseshoe crab. The name is a bit deceiving because it's not really a crab at all. It's much more closely related to arachnids. That's the group of animals that include spiders, scorpions and mites. It's an incredibly ancient animal. You can find fossils that look almost exactly the same as this that date back over 250 million years. So it's a very, very old organism indeed. And yeah, it is quite an interesting creature. If you turn it over, you can see all of the limbs that feed the mouth in the middle. So well done for those that guessed correctly. And we really hope that you'll try your luck for this week's Curiosity of the Week coming up next. All right, Stu, let's hear from some of those winners or some of the correct answers. Yeah, we had quite a lot of answers this week, but two came in almost immediately. Well, as soon as we played that, that clip last week, we had Louis, um, who, who, uh, who perfectly correctly identified it as an Atlantic horseshoe crab, Limulus polyphemus. He even got the Latin name absolutely spot on. So Louis, you are incredible. Well done for that identification. Yeah, that wasn't an easy one, especially down to the actual species of horseshoe crabs, because there's multiple species around the world. Um, I, I, I believe there's over 10, actually, around in different parts of the world that are alive today. So that was very good going. And also, I have to say a big shout out to Joanna as well, for also absolutely identifying it perfectly correctly as well. And she also specifically said, I believe it's not strictly classified as a crab, which is a very, very good um, observation. So well done, Joanna. So you guys did so well. But can you guess what this week's curiosity is? I think we've got that next. This week's curiosity is this object here. Can you guess what this is? I'll give you a clue. It isn't a toy or a rattle for a, for a child, but the noise is very important. It is used to make that sound to attract a certain animal. Can you guess what it is? All right. Very cool, Stu. That's going to be a tough one. It is. That is a tough one. Send in your answers, as Joe mentioned, to classroom at darwin200.com. Um, and we'll reveal it next week. We'll be beaming live from the Cape Verde Islands. So you'll find out what that is next week. But remember the sound. The sound is a clue. It's very important. All right. Well, Stuart, here we are. Episode four is wrapping up. Next week, we will be live uh, from Cape Verde. We're going to talk a little bit about, uh, about Darwin and the octopus. So we're going to have a beam in from the National uh, Marine Aquarium uh, in Plymouth and meet Barbara the octopus. We're going to visit the Natural History Museum in London. It is going to be quite uh, the event from Cape Verde. Very much so. Can't, can't wait. It's going to be very exciting. All right. Well, as we're wrapping up, I want to do a huge shout out to our classrooms who joined us today. Thank you so much for being with us, playing along with the Kahoot, sending in your amazing questions. And we're going to wrap up today's event uh, by thanking our sponsors. So once again, thank you, everyone, for being with us live. Episode four of the world's most exciting classroom. And we will see you next week from Cape Verde. <laughs>